Um, before we get started with our class on prayer and journaling, and I'm only barely going to touch on journaling today uh, as a, an adjunct function of prayer, let me ask if there were any questions that came out of your reading. Any thoughts? Uh, welcome back, Chris. Thank you. Any, um, anything that you read that you didn't understand or you want an additional comment on? Anything at all? Pat. Remember I asked you, I told you I was seven. And I have something for you. <laughs> Pat's question to me was, and I was going to get, get to this, so this is fine. Um, the relationship between Bible study and meditation, which we talked about last week, and prayer. Um, for those of you who have Whitney's book and have read it, um, on page 72 and 73, he actually gets into exactly that. Meditation is the in, sort of the intermediate step between Bible study and prayer. In fact, it's actually quite a healthy sign if you don't see a clear distinction between them because in the most mature practice of the spiritual disciplines, they become one process. But let me read you a couple of things from one from Whitney's actual words and then one from Thomas Manton, who was a Puritan preacher. Um, Whitney says this, The process works like this. After the input of a passage of scripture, that means reading or hearing, meditation allows us to take what God has said to us and think deeply on it, to digest it, and then speak to God about it in meaningful prayer. As a result, we pray about what we have encountered in the Bible, now personalized through meditation. But not only do we have something substantial to say in prayer and the confidence that we are praying God's thoughts to Him, but we transition smoothly into prayer with a passion for what we were praying about. Then, as we move on with our prayer, we don't jerk and lurch along because we already have some spiritual momentum. And again, quoting Thomas Manton, then I'll speak to this a little bit. Um, he wrote, meditation is a middle sort of duty between the Word, that is the Bible, and prayer, and hath respect to both. The Word feedeth meditation, and meditation feedeth prayer. These duties must always go hand in hand. Meditation must follow hearing and precede prayer. So what it means is, you read the Bible, and as you read Scripture, you should, you should be reading it with a, a prayerful attitude, saying, Lord... What do you want to say to me in this? Remember, that's what we talked about last week. The question is, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And when you come across something that really um, resonates. resonates or strikes or that your, your heart really focuses on, it jumps out at you. When we do Bible study, my question usually is, what strikes you about this? What jumps out at you? What I'm doing is saying, without always saying it, what is the Holy Spirit? bringing to the surface out of this passage. What is the Holy Spirit making you most aware of? I was just reading in James this morning as part of my preparation for Bible study, and for me, I read the passage that said, if you claim to have faith but have not deeds, the word that really struck me about that for the first time is claim. And so I spent time really thinking about and saying, Lord, help me understand you know, what this is and why did you cause this... That's the meditation process. Taking in God's Word was reading it. When the, when the word claim jumped out at me, I started thinking about, you know, we're always wanting to make claims to something grand. You know, that we claim that we are godly people, that we are righteous people, that we're God's own elect or whatever. Um, and inherent in that word is a sense in which if we have to claim it, then we don't really have it. Okay, and so I spent time thinking about that and meditating on it and then praying about it. So there you see, for me this morning, I'm giving you an example. There is the, the reading of God's Word, the taking in of God's Word. And then, by, and, and I start out with saying, God, show me what you want to show me in this. When something particularly strikes me, to spend time thinking about it. And letting it sink in and considering what, the, what, what it might mean and, and how it might be relevant to my life in Christ. And then to go to prayer. Now again, the most mature process here of Bible study and meditation and prayer, which are all part of the one process, the most mature people in the faith, I believe, are those for whom this all becomes sort of one thing, and you kind of flow in and out of the reading the scripture and meditating on it and praying about it as one time of devotional uh, commitment, okay? Does that help, Pat? Well, 
that's what I felt like. But I thought that we were trying to separate them and say, uh, sometimes you go meditate. And it, it, so that's not right. No. The meditation is we're talking about it. Now, later on in the spiritual, when we talk about spiritual disciplines, I may be talking a kind of, about a kind of meditation in which we, we don't start with reading the Bible. And it's, it's actually a kind of prayer. And we'll talk about that later. But for the sake of our understanding, think about Bible study and meditation and prayer as kind of a three-part process in which they all kind of merge into each other. Okay? okay? Yes? Um, your commentary on this has brought a, a thought in my mind. Um, a question, I guess, more than anything. I, I get the three becoming one and, and flowing in and out of that. But I also... Can you comment any on uh, the prayer of intercession? Mm -hmm. As you're doing intercessory prayer, it seems to me that that's focused a little more heavily on prayer as opposed to the prayer that's related to the meditation of the scripture. Very much so. And in fact, when we talk about prayer today, I'm going to be talking in general terms about prayer as a spiritual discipline. But when it comes to the practical, the, the practical uh, <clears throat> process of prayer, I recommend the Acts prayer which is A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Mm -hmm. Supplication being the intercessory prayer. It's the same thing, where we're asking for God to, to bless or to heal or whatever it is, either for, for someone we know and care about or for a situation or for ourselves. And yes, there is a time, you know, there's more than one kind of prayer, basically. When we talk about Bible study, meditation, and prayer, that's a personal devotional time where I'm asking God to help me grow close to Him and in faith in Him. Then there are, there are times of prayer that we need to set aside as a discipline where we are adoring God, confessing our sins to God, we are thanking Him for His gifts to us, and we, are, we have prayers of intercession. When we talk about meditation and prayer and Bible study together, those are my personal, those are, like for me, personal devotional time where I'm asking God to grow me, to make me more like Christ. And in those circumstances, usually what I will do is I will have that sort of time, and then I will get to a more structured kind of prayer, which will include a prayer of supplication. Where, or of intercession, where I'm asking God to bless, okay? And, and, and there are different, you know, for the same reason that there's different kind of conversations I have with Carolyn, depending upon what the particular situation, circumstance, need is, whatever, there are different ways in which we come to God in prayer. Yes? Can you tell me again what the Acts is? Uh, we'll get to that. It's A-C-T-S. It stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Supplication is the same as intercession, where we're asking for God to intercede or to provide. Okay? And we'll get into that toward the end here. Any other questions or comments from your reading? Judy? If it's, I, I forget which book I read in, but it, we, we don't have to say if it's, if it's God's will. Mm -hmm. If it's God's right. will, you know, I, I, this, I can't remember what it right. says. But it's in Foster, yes. Okay. Um, and... I think what Richard Foster is going with that, as we grow closer to God, as we grow closer in our spiritual relationship with Him, then we will get a much clearer sense of what His will is. The fact is, if we are praying for something that is good or is right, we don't have to qualify it by, if it be your will. Because if we're not careful, that if it be your will can become a, a statement of lack of faith. Okay? And that was not the case with Jesus. We only have one example of that in Scripture, and that is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. It had to do with going to the crucifixion, going to the cross. That's the only real example we have of that, and yet I think there's a tendency for Christians, almost as kind of a, an excuse, or a qualifier, or a lack of faith, to say, well, if it's your will, Father, then let this be blah, blah, blah. I think that as we grow closer to the Lord, He wants us to be bolder about that. If the answer is no, He'll tell us. Okay. But we need to have more confidence that He is there for us and listening to us, that He desires what is good for us, and He wants us to pray with some confidence. And if we're praying, that will be done as simply a way of not having any confidence in the Lord, then that's not good. And I think that's what Foster was getting at. Martin. Uh, Paul had an affliction. 
that he prayed for three times. Right. He, he did all kinds of miracles and other things, so it wasn't the case that uh, the power wasn't there. But exactly. God's grace was sufficient. Yeah, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, says he has a thorn in the flesh. Most scholars believe it was bad eyesight, because there's a couple of evidences that you know Paul says, uh, I'm writing this with my own hand. You notice what big letters there are. Okay, because the idea was apparently it's believed his eyes were very bad. But Paul said that he had a thorn in the flesh, and three times he prayed to the Lord to remove that thorn from his flesh. And each time the Lord said, no, because my power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul accepted that. But three times he prayed, but God gave him a very clear message about that. And even an understanding of why. Because Paul, great minister of the Lord, you know, the... The, the one who planted the churches, really launched the Gentile church movement and everything else, um, he prayed, and the answer was not what he asked for. Jesus prayed, the answer was not what he asked for. The prosperity preachers who tell you that if you pray in confidence and faith that God has to give you what you want, that's a lie from the pit of hell. The, the salvation of every one of us and of all who have believed in Jesus was entirely dependent upon the fact that God did not give Jesus the thing he asked for in the Garden of Gethsemane. And do you think it was because he didn't have enough faith? <laughs> Hardly. So the idea that God has to give us what we ask for is not biblical. Okay, we're getting into all kinds of stuff here. Anything else about your reading or any preliminary questions before we get into prayer? We're talking about prayer. I sort of wondered whether we haven't spent half the time talking and half the time doing, but yes. Well, uh, you know, you have me thinking about this. It's a little of a lack of faith to say if your will is on. And on the other hand, maybe in my case, it's like faking a little humility. Mm -hmm. Faking a little humility, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think you're right. And now, there is a place for doing that. And don't misunderstand me. Obviously, since Jesus, there was a circumstance in which it was appropriate for him. All I'm saying is be careful that when you say, well, not my will, but your will be done. That it's you're not either just sort of doing a quickie, you know, and kind of shoveling off any sense of responsibility for it, you know, or that it really is a lack of faith. In other words, you're sort of, you're putting a condition on there. Well, if God doesn't answer this, then, you know, I'll be okay. Instead of taking seriously that he told us to bring our knees before the throne of grace and ask for what we need with some confidence okay so there is a place and a time for that but most of the time I hear people using that in prayers or that I'm aware of people using it in prayers it actually is a lack of faith rather than the other way around Grace. sometimes we don't know what's best for us right, and absolutely. then we can say whatever your will is right right and that's fair I mean in fact I think the way to start any time of prayer, and I'm going to talk about that, is basically to say, Lord, I am a dumb sheep. <laughs> but you promised to take care of the dumb sheep because you're the great shepherd. And so teach me. Show me. Show me what your will is. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is that we start our prayer time assuming we've got it all figured out and that God is waiting for us to tell him what he ought to do. <laughs> Instead of starting our prayer time with saying, Lord, what is your will? What do you want? Help me understand that so that I will know how to pray. So that my prayers will be in concert with your will. Um, I, one of the, the people was very meaningful to me in my seminary days was a man named David Watson. David Watson was an Anglican priest, a very committed evangelical, charismatic evangelical from Great Britain. He had led a whole revival movement using, uh, amongst other things, the arts. And he had a team, a, re a renewal team that visited seminary where I was a couple of times, and they would use street theater, and uh, there's a company called Writing Lights. It's a Christian uh, theater group in York, England, where Dave was from. Um, they would use theater and music and uh, all kinds of things in order to get people's attention. They would go on the subways in New York, or I'm sorry, in uh, London, for instance, and uh, they had a very funny routine about the, about the football, uh, what's the word they use? The, the so rowdies, uh, the football rowdies. There's a name for them. Well, yeah, it's so it is soccer, but there's a name for these guys. Anyway, they're rabbits, sort of, ooh, 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 you know, and they had a wonderful sketch about that. Anyway, um, David Watson uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and he had gotten to know John Wimber quite well. You know the name John Wimber? John Wimber started the Vineyard Fellowship, which was one of the first um, charismatic fellowship, church fellowship groups in the United States. 
Well, Wimber co-taught a class that I had with David Watson and, and a couple other people. Um, and when David was diagnosed with cancer, John Wimber went to see him in the hospital, you know, when he was first in the undergoing treatments. And I heard John Wimber tell the story, and John said, I went in, and as I always do, my first prayer was, Lord, what do you want me to pray? And he said, and, and the Lord made it very clear to me immediately that David was not going to live. And so I did not pray for his healing. Because my first prayer was, Lord, tell me how you want me to pray. And he said, the thing I was led to pray for was that David, in the last months of his life, and that the legacy he had left behind would be ever increasing in glorifying God. And that even in his death, David would be a symbol of what it meant to be a, a true man of God. But John Wimper said, from the first moment that I walked in his room and said, Lord, teach, show me how to pray, I knew that David was an illness. And that that was not the way God wanted me to pray because that was not his will. Okay? So we need to be careful. Now that doesn't mean if he had not had that clear message, then it would have been very appropriate for him to pray for healing, for pray for, to pray for David to, to have overcome the cancer and to have come back. But because Wimber was a humble enough and a godly enough man to start by saying, Lord, how do you want me to pray? And having a very clear message of that, then he was obedient to that. But we don't think about asking God how we should pray. We think, let's go tell God what he ought to be doing. All right? Let's get into that, and we'll talk about it. Ross. Yeah. Is there meditation alone? Yes, there is a time, and that's what I was talking about. And we'll get into this later on in the course, uh, where, and it's a kind of prayer where we simply sit... You, the thing about Christian meditation that is different than Eastern meditation or New Age meditation or some That's yoga meditation, okay, is that we meditate, the, the Eastern meditation and the things that have come out of it, the, the goal is to empty your mind. And they have various exercises they use. For instance, uh, one of them is they'll say, focus on a black dot in the center of a white piece of paper. The idea being that you try not to focus on anything, that you completely empty your mind. Well, I think I said last week when we talked about it, that actually is dangerous, spiritually, if you believe in spiritual forces. And in fact, Christian meditation is not an emptying of your mind, but rather a focusing on your mind, of your mind on a particular thing, which is God. It may be on a passage of Scripture that, that you have in front of you. It may be on the nature of God's sacrifice for you. It may be on, um, on the name of Jesus Christ which has real power and significance, but that you are focused on something that is of God, not trying to empty your mind of all things. That's the difference between Christian meditation and uh, med Eastern meditation or those things that are based on Eastern meditation. Okay, you got that? Mm -hmm. We do not ever try to empty ourselves because if we do, there are spiritual forces that would very much like to fill that vacuum. Mm -hmm. right? and we need to be careful about that. Okay, let's talk about prayer. Um, we start by recognizing that to everyone, prayer is important. A 90, 1992 Newsweek survey, which was done by Andrew Greeley, you may know Andrew Greeley's name, he was a Catholic priest, a sociologist, and an author. He did a survey, a nationwide survey, that was published in Newsweek, which identified that 78% of all Americans, all Americans, claim to pray at least once a week. That means have some conversation or some, some directed communication to God. 57% of all Americans said they prayed every day. 20% of the people who claim to be atheists or agnostics said that they prayed every day. <laughs> yeah, there, there, is, there are no atheists in the foxholes, and basically the whole world is a foxhole. <laughs> um, on any given day, Greeley's studies showed more people will pray than will go to work, exercise, or have sex. Now, we get to the question of what does prayer mean to people, and that's going to be a topic, but let me give you a more recent study. This one was a study done by the uh, Pew Foundation, the Pew Forum of U.S. Religious Landscape Survey, which was in 2007, and you will notice that the percentage actually went up from 57% in 1992. 2007, 15 years later, it was 58%. Now, this study broke it down. The most prayerful religious people are Jehovah's Witnesses. Keep trying. Um, they claim, 89% of them claim to pray on a daily basis. 
Mormons, 82%, uh, black Protestants, 80% evangelical Protestants, which is me, and I think most of you, I don't know for sure, 78%, Muslim, 71%, Hindu, 62%, Orthodox Christian, that is Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, would be 60%, Catholic, 58%, Mainline Protestant, 53%. Methodists and Baptists. <laughs> and then Buddhist 45, Jewish 26, unaffiliated 22. Probably the, that includes the agnostics and atheists right there. Uh, interestingly enough, the older you get, the more likely you are to pray. Duh. 18, this is 18 to 29 is 48%, 30 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65 plus is at 68%. <coughs> Women are half again, almost more likely to pray than men. Dummies. Uh, man, I mean. Thank you. And the more money you make, the less likely you are to pray. This is less than 30,000, 64%, over 100,000, 48%. So may God preserve the wealthy white males. <laughs> you know, our mainline problems, whatever. So you get the point that prayer is important. Whether people know what they're doing or not, whatever faith background they come from, there is apparently something inherent in us that causes us to want to communicate with God. Now, so what is prayer? What are we talking about? One of the problems is that there is not a consistent or uniform understanding of what prayer is amongst people. The Webster's definition is that prayer is an address as a petition, petitions when you're asking for something, to God or a God in word or thought. So it's asking God for something mainly, all right? So that definition captures what most people may think prayer is, but is that correct? No. That's the question we have. No, good for you. Three points. Um, as Christians, we believe that prayer is not a matter of asking God for things, but rather it is a matter of our relationship with God. Prayer is a conversation with God that occurs in the context of our relationship. Again, my relationship with Carolyn, if the only conversation I ever had with her was me asking her to do something for me, how healthy would that relationship be? <laughs> so the issue, prayer as we understand prayer, is not what, you know, what I say, it is not what I can get. The issue of prayer is, who is God to me? Who is God to me? What is my relationship with Him? Our prayer lives are dictated by and, and built on the foundation of our relationship with God. If our relationship with God is unsound or is inappropriate or is built wrongly, then our prayer life is not going to be what we expect or hope or plan for. The sad part is, that earlier graph, all those people praying every day, the vast majority of those people, almost by definition of the groups, are not, they're not getting through because they don't understand what prayer really is all about. Okay? Now, if we have as our definition that it is answering the question, who is God to me, that it is based upon my relationship with God, then what kind of difference should that make? in terms of how I approach prayer and what I expect out of prayer. That's really the key to understanding the historic, spiritual, and biblical, spiritual discipline of prayer. Now to get to an understanding of that, when I say the biblical understanding of prayer, there are a number of words in scripture which we translate in English as prayer. The differences between those words are, are important, I think, because they, they begin to give us a more three-dimensional understanding of what prayer is or what it can be. The first word that we have in scripture that is translated from the Greek to English as prayer is the Greek word aiteo. Aiteo is to officially request or demand something, usually for yourself. Aiteo is the kind of request that you would make to um, a police officer who's not giving you back your driver's license. I have a right to that, give it to me. Okay. It is to demand something or officially request it. That word is used in Scripture. Uh, in Matthew 18, the passage, again, I tell you that if two or more of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, I tell you, 
it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Now, there's other qualifiers around that, but that is one use of that word. Sometimes, the word aiteo in scripture signifies a negative. It signifies, you know, demanding something for selfish reasons or because you want it. That's not an example in that passage. But it's claiming something you believe you have a right to. But it is in there. Okay. A second word in scripture that we translate as prayer is the word uh, deomai. Deomai means to request something to address a need or a lack, but to do so courteously or even warmly. It's not to demand a right, but it's to ask for something almost as a favor. It is a por favor kind of prayer. Um, Luke 22, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed, day oh my, for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. This means asking God for help, um, asking him in a courteous way for help, but still there's implied in this a little bit more formality. A third word, which we have in scripture, that is translated as prayer, is erotapo. Erotao, and th these things sort of move along in levels of intimacy. Erotao is an intimate or a personal request or a question. Um, it is something you would ask of an intimate, somebody that you care for, that you have a relationship with. It, and uh, John 14, 16, 17, Jesus said, And I will ask Erotao the Father, and he will give, what, give another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So this is a more intimate or personal way of asking God for help. Um, and this is a word that is often used, particularly with reference to the apostles. Um, now, the, word, the first word that I use, the aiteo, which means to make a demand, Jesus never uses that word in his own prayers. He never aiteo, he never demands anything of the Father. Sometimes his prayers, he refers to using erotao, sometimes deomai. But the most common word that is used by Jesus with regard to his prayers is the word prosukomai. Prosukomai means and, uh, to earnestly desire God's participation. It's actually from two words, pros, which means nearness to, and yukomai, which means to earnestly desire. This word that we translate as prayer literally means to call upon God to get involved, to be close to us, to participate with us. We desire his closeness with regard to an issue. And again, this is the most common word that's used with regard to Jesus' prayer life. And I'll give you a passage which really exemplifies how this is different, significantly different, than the other three words. It is a passage from Mark 9, 17, um, which is a, a passage that often mystifies people, but when you understand the different word that's used here, you understand what, what this is about. Mark writes, a man in the crowd answered, the, the apostles had been given the power to go out and drive out demons and to heal people, and they've gone out, and then there's, there's a kerfuffle going on, and Jesus comes over and says, what are you all arguing about? A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now, the disciples have been successful in driving out spirits. Okay. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. In, uh, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. One of my favorite prayers in scripture. I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. 
After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. The word for prayer here, here is prosukomai. Now that passage in English, you go, well, but they were praying for everybody else, and it worked. What? Because the word prosukomai is, is used here, it means that this kind only comes out when you invite God's actual participation with you in this. Don't just ask God to do something. Ask Him to be with you in this whole process. There is an intimacy. It implies relationship. And so that particular word, prosukomai, which is translated prayer, has a different meaning than a lot of the other words, which is the only way we can understand what this, how this makes sense. Prosukomai means we actually ask God Himself to come near, that we get God directly and intimately involved in a situation or particularly in our needs, that we ask Him to be with us, in relationship with us, regarding the thing that we're praying about. Prosukomai. It's a critically important word. Now, coming back to what we started with, so many people think that prayer simply means asking God for things. Asking God to give you the stuff that you want. Um, and because people think of prayer that way, and yet their prayers don't often get answered, what happens is many of us, even Christians, don't pray much. When we do pray, we, we're so one-dimensional about it, asking God to do stuff for us, we either try to demand it, well, God, you said if two more of us are here that we have a right to ask, so we're asking. You know, that's the ideo. We may even courteously request it of God which is the Deo Mai, we may even have a sense in which we are asking intimately. But the fundamental foundation of true prayer is prosukomai, asking God to be with us, to be there with us. The whole relationship we have with God is built into that. So the essence of true prayer is that prayer is a relationship. It is intimacy with God. That's how we need to think about prayer. It is not where we go and ask for stuff. If we understand that prayer is a relationship with God, then everything else about our prayer life will change. We will begin to know more what God wants, so we will know what we can ask, what we can and should ask for. That was John Wimber before he prayed for David Watson. He had a sense of God's presence. He asked God, you know, what do you desire in this? And then he prayed according to what God told him. Because he had the ability to understand what God wants for him. Um, we also will have more confidence that God will answer us. So that we are less likely to want to put qualifiers in there. To have an excuse if he doesn't answer the way we want. We, oh, I'm sorry. We will have more grace then to accept God's answers. Even if they're not the answers we wanted. And so we have to be able to understand the will of God in relationship. Now, Carolyn, before you were even married, I taught some classes in, in the Northwest on prayer. And she said one time, uh, I've actually got it in my notes, Carolyn, since before we were married. Oh, I said, Carolyn Hansen said it well. That's what I have in my notes. Oh, thank you. The, the, <laughs> Carolyn said, the problem I sometimes have with prayer is it's like going to someone with whom I have a very formal relationship and asking him for favors. Yeah. It's like you have a very rich friend who lives in the big house on the hill. And he has told you, if you ever need anything, come and see me. Well, you go and ask for something, and then you go and ask for something, and you go and ask for something, and you go and ask for something. At a certain point, if you've got any sensibilities at all, that starts feeling uncomfortable and you don't want to go anymore. For so many people, that's the way their prayer life is. God is the rich guy on the hill who said, come and tell me what I can do for you. And yet, because the only thing we ever do is ask him for stuff, we start feeling uncomfortable with it and stop doing it, or certainly stop doing it as often. Because we have a fundamental misunderstanding about what true prayer is. That idea of an intimate relationship where God participates with us. Angie is sleeping in a chair back there. Would she be more comfortable if we had to lie down on the sofa? No, this is the most comfortable thing okay. for us. All right, I just want to make sure you're okay. And she's even listening, so that's good. The rest of you who are sleeping, you need to... You know. <laughs> so once we understand and begin to develop our relationship with God in a way that's not so formal, then we begin to be comfortable with prayer, including asking for the things we need. But again, 
True prayer, the deepest kind of prayer, is to seek nearness and relationship with God, which leads us to understand His will, what He wants for us, and to be reassured that He loves us and cares for us and wants to give us the things that are good, and we can begin to accept with grace, not getting what we think we want. Our prayer life is dictated by our relationship with God, and so ultimately it is a way of saying, who is God to me? My prayer life is a reflection of who is God to me. He's not just somebody who promised to give me stuff. You know, he's not Santa Claus. He's not some cosmic bellhop that I ring my little bell and say, bring me a new car, or whatever. And yet for many people, that's exactly how they treat their prayer. Um, prayer is first and foremost to climb onto the lap of God like a child, to relax and enjoy the intimacy of his presence with us. The idea that we are like children running around in the world, and at the end of a long day when the children are tired and they come into their father, and they, they don't have anything to say anymore, they just want to crawl up into their father's lap and just rest there. To be with their father. Not because they're asking for anything or need anything, just to be there. That is the highest kind of prayer. To desire that kind of intimacy and relationship with God, with the knowledge that God loves us, and He is our Father, and He wants us to be present with Him like a child in His lap. In fact, that's why we were made. We were made in the image of God so that we could be creatures with whom God could relate. We could have a relationship with Him. That relationship was broken, which is why Jesus hung on that cross for us and died and was resurrected in order to re-establish, to rebuild the bridge that allows us to come back into relationship with God the Father. When we do not pray or do not pray rightly, then we are voiding the most important part of why Jesus died for us, to make it possible for us once again to have an intimate relationship with God the Father. And the last thing we should think of prayer is that prayer is us talking all the time and making God listen to us. That's not what prayer should be. Questions about that? This is huge. Okay. Now, in Richard Foster's book, Foster says prayer is the most, first and most fundamental of all spiritual disciplines. But Whitney says prayer is critical, but we have to start with Bible study. I agree with Whitney which is the reason I did Bible study first. Because in order to have a relationship with God, we have to have some sense of who He is. And where did He tell us about Himself? So I think we have to, we have to discipline ourselves first to the study of His Word so that we know who God is, and then we are led into the discipline of prayer so that we can experience a relationship with the God who has described Himself to us. It's not either or. They're both critical. But I think that our prayer life, that there's a danger of it going in the wrong direction unless we have also disciplined ourselves to learn about God through His Word. Okay? So in that regard, I agree more with Whitney than I do with, with Foster. Questions about any of that? Carolyn? Are you going to discuss um, group prayer? I hadn't planned to today. Um, let's see what we get to. Okay. We'll, we'll, we may come back around to this one. Again, this one is so important, and it does relate Bible study, meditation, prayer, is I may revise the schedule and come back and spend more time with this. And I'm also feeling more and more convicted that, that we may be making the mistake that so many have made, and that is we're talking about prayer, or we're reading about prayer, and we're not praying. So we may want to do more. It, it might be more part of, is there, I should know what the outline of the class is, because you show it to us every week, but there's a worship thing? Uh, there is. Yeah. So we'll talk so maybe about that. Maybe we'll talk about that there. Good. All right, so why do we pray? I'm getting very practical here now. We talked about our need for relationship with God. The first reason why we pray is just that, because we need to. People, everybody on that chart I showed you earlier, all 58% of the people in America who do this, and Canadians too, and just I had a study from America, so the only reason to use that one, they have a sense of needing to communicate with somebody bigger than us. You've heard, probably heard me say before that every culture that has ever existed that we're aware of has had some kind of idea that there was something wrong with us. There was something broken in us. There was something lacking in us. Well, we believe that that is, in fact, we know that that is that we were made for a relationship with God and we are separate from that relationship until we accept Jesus Christ and are reunited with the Father. Now, 
because that's inside all of us and we all recognize that, mm -hmm. we pray because there's something in us, even if we do it wrong, even if we pray to the wrong God, we pray because there's a sense that we have, a, there's an inherent sense that we need to be in communion with God, the divine. I believe we pray because we need to. Okay? A second reason we pray as Christians is because Scripture commands it. There are 73 references in the New Testament to prayer using those various Greek words I mentioned. Almost, almost all of them are admonitions to us to pray. They're instructions. You should be praying. Or they're assumptions. Like when Jesus is talking to the disciples, he says, and when you pray, he doesn't say, and if you pray. There are either instructions to pray or there's an assumption that we are going to pray because it is so much a part of what it means for us to be children of God, if we understand it correctly. And the third reason why we pray is because it is our strongest weapon against evil and against the forces of Satan. Samuel Chadwick, I, I quote here, says, Satan laughs at our toils, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Charles Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Mm -hmm. R.A. Torrey said, we are too busy to pray, and so we are too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little. The power of God is lacking in our lives and in our work. We have not because we ask not. Prayer is the most significant force we have against the devil and his effort to try to pull us down. Okay? Now you all remember, you can stop me with questions if you need to, right? When we practice prayer, a prayer of relationship with God, two significant things happen. First, we get to know the mind of God better. The example that I gave you of John Wimber understanding what God desired for David Watson and therefore knowing how to pray. When we become people of relational prayer with God, we know better know the mind of God. C.S. Lewis famously said that prayer does not change God, prayer changes me. I am changed as I pray and grow to understand God's will. There's scriptural support for this. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I believe that our mind is renewed, our lives are transformed, as we seek relationship with God, most particularly in prayer. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that He may instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. We get to know the mind of God as we get closer to Him, and that occurs primarily through prayer. And I quoted this earlier, Martin Luther saying, Love God and do as you please. Quoted in Bible study. Luther did not mean, love God and then go out and rape and pillage and do whatever you want. It meant, love God, come to know the mind of God, come, in, come to know the character of God by relationship, and then what is pleasing to God will be pleasing to you. And that will be the thing you seek. If you feel your life needs to be changed, then grow closer to God and ask Him to change it. Don't try to do it by your own will, thinking that will make him happy in some way. The old adage, don't, don't try to be better so that God will love you. Let God love you so that you can be better. Okay? Grow closeness to God, primarily through prayer first, and then God will renew you. He will teach you his mind. He will grow you in his character. That's the way it works. And then, the second thing, when we practice relational prayer with God, after knowing His mind, is we will learn to come to Him in humility. We will learn what it means to be humble in our relationship with God. Now, by, defini by definition, faith requires humility. You cannot have faith in God until you've taken your faith off of yourself. The word faith, pisteo in the New Testament, means literally to put your trust in God. Humility means to show a spirit of deference or submission. How can we put our trust in God unless we have a spirit of deference and submission, meaning 
taking our faith off of ourselves. Several passages, James 4, 6. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you can, this is the passage I just uh, read, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. This is a statement of humble faith. I haven't figured it all out. I am not pious and righteous and deserving of anything you can do for me. I believe, Lord God, you can help me. But help my unbelief, the part that I don't get, that I don't understand, that I don't... That's, a, that's humility, right? Faith and humility are twins. We cannot put our trust in God unless we are willing to show a spirit of deference and submission to Him. Faith and humility. So we need to understand that we must be more humble, and as we learn to come to God, He will give us that kind of humility. He will teach us what it means to have a spirit of submission to Him, rather than thinking it's all about us. Mary? Is there another passage in Scripture that where somebody says, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Well, that's it, in Mark. That, that's, that's the only one I know of, where the father of the son uh, who was uh, demon-possessed okay. says, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay. Uh, or, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief, is the way the NIV translates it. Okay, thanks. So what does it mean to be humble in our prayer? What does it mean or look like to pray humbly? First, we learn to come to God admitting that we don't know for sure what is best. Now, there are times when it's legitimate to say, not my will, but your will be done, as long as we really are saying, Lord, show me your will. Teach me what you want. Again, what John Weber did with Dave Watson. We come to God saying, we're not sure what is best here, Lord, and part of what we need is to know your will, is to know your direction. This is what I said earlier that, um, you know, I, I often pray, Lord, I'm a poor dumb sheep. I really am doing the best I can, but I don't have all the answers. I don't see clearly enough or far enough to know what is best in, a, in this circumstance. Help me to know how I should pray and what is best and what I should look to here. So that's the first thing. That's what it means to pray humbly. Not go to God and say, God, Ross here, you need to get on the stick. You need to go do this or that or something else. What's wrong? You slacking off? Come on. No. In fact, I'm exaggerating here for effect, but for a lot of Christians, that's exactly what their prayer life is made up of, is going to him and saying, this is what you need to do, God. Get with it. And then not knowing why that doesn't seem to work. So secondly, we need to say to God that we know he loves us and wants the best for us. The people who say um, they prayed to God and God didn't answer, apparently he doesn't care is the ultimate statement of lack of faith. That is the ultimate evidence that we believe we've got our act together and apparently God doesn't. We know what's right, God doesn't. We have to always be clear in our minds that God loves us, He wants the best for us, He has done so much for us. Whatever happened to gratitude, people? All that we have that is good, we just read that in James. All good things come from God, including the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, who He sacrificed for us, or who willingly sacrificed Himself for us. A third way in which we um, pray humbly is we tell God within our confessed limitations that there are still desires in our heart, and what are they? People who mumble around and say, well, Lord, I don't know what ought to be, but whatever you think, you just do it, and I'm sure it'll be right, and everything will be good, and you know, don't, uh, it's not up to me, it's up to you. You know, that's, that's a version of thy will be done prayer. If we trust God loves us and wants the best for us, then we will openly share with him from our heart of what we desire, confessing that if that's not right, then, then that's not what I want either, Lord. But we tell him what we want. And then we are willing to accept what and how he answers. And finally, a humble prayer is one in which we don't become angry at God if he doesn't give us what we ask for. Because again, that means that's anti-faith. 
When we become frustrated or angry at God for not doing what we ask Him to do, no matter how important we thought it was, even if it means the life of someone we love, folks, when we react that way, we are reacting from pride. Because I think I know better than God. That I know what was appropriate. When I, when I get angry or frustrated with God because He did not answer the prayer the way I wanted, I'm saying, obviously, I'm smarter than you are, God. I can see further than you. I'm wiser than you. I know better than you. What is that? That's wrong. That's wrong. That's one thing it is. <laughs> right? Um, and when we do that, we give up God. We say, okay, you no longer are God. You're just around like the cosmic bellhop to bring me what I want you better get it right, and you better not take very long, or I'm going to report you to management. Okay? The perfect example of all of these principles that I just talked about is the Gethsemane prayer. Um, and you know the Gethsemane prayer, where Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he, set, he has Peter, James, and John wait for him, and he goes and he prays to the Father, and he prays, Abba, Father, if it be your will, let this cup, which is the crucifixion, pass from me, yet not my will, but thy will be done. We are told that Jesus prays that three times. He prays it so intently that his tears were falling to the ground like drops of blood, we're told. The intensity of that. And so, here, we understand that Jesus bases his prayer on his intimate relationship with the Father. Because he starts it out, Abba, which means dear Father. Abba literally means daddy. It is a diminutive. It's, it's an Aramaic word, which, which is not formal. It's not like my father or our father. It literally means daddy. So Jesus starts his prayer to the Father in the context of an intimate relationship. He then acknowledges the power and authority of the Father. He says, Father, everything is possible for you. There's nothing outside God's wisdom or outside his power. And then Jesus tells the Father very directly what it is he wants. None of this, well, whatever you think, thinking, that's fine. No, Jesus says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. That is what I desire. And he's unapologetic about asking for what he wants. He then acknowledges that the Father knows best and confesses his willingness to accept the Father's will. When he said, yet not what I will, but what you will be done. And Jesus is persistent. Returning the third time, he prayed. Each time he goes and finds the, the three uh, close to him asleep. And says, could you not stay awake with me for one hour? The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. That's where that's, that passage comes from. And then he goes back three times and, and prays this. But once the Father's will was revealed to him, Jesus accepts it. And he moves on in strength, even though he had not been given what he wanted, what he asked for. In fact, he says to his, to his followers, rise, exclamation point, let us go, exclamation point. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus left the Garden of Gethsemane in power and in strength with the assurance that he was about to be betrayed and tortured and crucified. That's the model for us. Intimate relationship with the Father, acknowledging that He knows best and has all power and authority, telling Him what it is we desire, acknowledging that He knows best and that we will accept His will, being persistent in our prayer, and then, whatever response we get, accepting it and moving on with, with an affirmation that this is right and good and true, even if it's not what we want Questions about that? Yes? Well, earlier in my Christian life, when I would pray and use the term, your will be done, not mine, I think in many cases it was done by me to say, if I don't add that and it doesn't happen, then I, my, my faith may be in jeopardy. Right. I, I, my belief may be wrong. I don't, want, I don't want that to be true because I believe what I believe. You leave yourself an out. Yes. You leave yourself an excuse that you can fall back on instead of having to say, maybe the problem is that my relationship is wrong or my faith isn't strong enough, or whatever it is. So I think it's absolutely true. 
we use thy will be done as an out, as an excuse. It's, it's, a, it's actually a demonstration of a lack of our faith, a lack of our trust. I don't want God to look bad. Yeah, I don't want God to look bad. <laughs> I, mean, I gotta give him every opportunity to, you know, look good in this situation. So Michael. It seems closely aligned with the fact that we often find ourselves praising God anytime something wonderful happens or goes our way and then yeah. well, what if something tragic happened? That doesn't mean he's not a great God. And yeah. that, I mean That's true. We we praise God when you know and acknowledge him when good things happen and when bad things happen. It's the last thing that comes to our mind. And yet, what does Job say? When Job's wife says, curse God and die, Job says, are we going to thank God for the good things that happen and not for the bad? Do, are we going to accept God for the good things that come from God and not the bad? You know, Scripture says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God. That's not easy. Okay? And yet that's the instruction. That's not really always bad. What's that? The bad is not always really bad. Absolutely. Frequently, it's, it's, we simply, as I said before, we don't see far enough. We don't see clearly. And we don't know what what's behind all of this. I mean, like, take Arturo, for example. Mm -hmm. That was not bad. Yeah. Yeah, God, God blessed through that. Uh, there's an example in Cory Ten Boom's book, um, The Hiding Place. Cory Ten Boom, Dutch woman who was in the concentration camp, she and her sister were there. And... The barracks that they got put in, I think it was in Theresienstadt, the, the, one of the concentration camps, and they were in the women's barrack, and they go in, and um, they, there was a, somebody had a copy of the Bible, uh, in, or New Testament, and the women would read it together. Well, at one point, Corey is going ballistic over all the fleas in this barracks, about how can we give thanks to God for these fleas? And then her sister pointed out to her that the fleas keep the guards from coming in. Mm -hmm. And because the guards don't come in, we can share together God's Word. Because if they came in here and saw that, they would take it away from us. So here's something that Corey, and she confesses, her first reaction was, how can this possibly be God's will? You know, they, How can we give thanks for that? And her sister pointed out to her, it is that inconvenience, and yes, it's a pain, <laughs> that allows us such a wonderful grace that we wouldn't otherwise have. So many things in our lives are like that, and yet I don't think we can see it too often. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to have humility about it, because we don't see it too often. Mm -hmm. Bill? Do you think that this prayer occurred because Jesus gave us an example, because he knew from Isaiah 53 the will of God? Mm -hmm. Yes, he knew the will of God, but I don't think this was just, Jesus wasn't just play acting in order to give us an example. I think he truly went before God the Father and asked him, is there not another way for this to happen? Because remember, he was fully human. He was fully God, but he was also fully human. And he knew what was going to happen, and he knew how horrible it was going to be. And so I believe that Jesus, in his full humanity, went before God the Father, which is one of the reasons this should be an encouragement to us, is that you know we don't read this prayer and say, well, yeah, that was Jesus. Of course, he was God. He could do that. No, I think that this is an example of Jesus as full of humanity, and yet, within his full humanity, his submission to the will of God the Father in heaven. And so, I believe he really was praying, Father in heaven, if there is any other way that we can accomplish this, my human side does not want to have to go through what I know is going to happen. And God the Father said, no, this must be. And Jesus accepted it victoriously. Not just, not begrudgingly, not grievously, but victoriously once it was clear to him. But I think he really was asking God the Father, is there not some other way we can do this? Okay? That's his full humanity. Grace? Commenting question about God's will, going back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Many people feel that it's actually wrong to say, if it be your will, when you're praying for healing. Right. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Well, again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it if you really are, if it's a way of sincerely saying, Lord, let us know what your will is. Show us your will. But if you're just using it as an excuse, as an out, as a way of sort of having something to fall back on in case it doesn't happen, what you ask for doesn't happen, then that's not acceptable. But I think, again, Jesus modeled to say, if it be your will, let this happen. But he was doing it as a way of saying, Father, show me your will. Not to make an excuse. So there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Uh, Barbara first and then Barbara. Show me your will is better than saying... If it be yes, your will. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in Jesus' case, I think it means the same thing, but we need to be careful what it means for us. Yes, Barbara? You know, it's interesting, because for me, I always 
believe that it was, well, if it's your will, was a level of resignation by a human. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I always bristled at that. It was just a cop out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I can't control, uh, so therefore, I'm just putting it out there. Right. And that is truly a, a lack of faith. Yeah, I agree. That's but, I, right. but I do at times, I have felt at times that it was a cop out by people yeah. to say, well, I, I don't, I'm not responsible for anything. I have no will. I've been given a mind and a brain and a heart. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not planning on using <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm just going to just gonna, gonna, just yeah, gonna yeah, That's it. I'm and I really, really, I, that bothered me a great deal. Yeah, and I think, you know, sort of nail that down. If you say, you know, if it be your will, if that really does mean for you, Lord, show me what your will is, then that's legitimate. If it is a way of just sort of, you know, just, just sort of resignation, like, oh, whatever, I'm not sure you're going to do this anyway, so just, I'm leaving it there. Yeah. And no, that's not valid. Okay. Marvin, and then uh, they've got two or three other people. Yes? In my former Christian life, I didn't get past the giving, telling God, do this, do this, do this. But I thought I graduated when I said, Nevertheless, not my oh, yeah. family that's what yeah. that would come, and and it was disappointing. After wandering from God for over thirty years, I'm back and I'm learning things that I'd never knew before. And my prayer starts out every day: Create in me a clean heart, O mm -hmm. God, and renew right spirit. Cast me not away from your presence. Remove not your Holy Spirit from me. I know that God wants that. I don't have to be afraid to pray that. Absolutely. I need to look into myself and say, Now, is there? Wickedness is the evil. Is there things that I need to find? Absolutely. And then I can go on with my request. And I'll say to God, this is what I want, and I'm going to do my best for this to happen. But I know I'm not in control of this situation, yep. and I will accept what you do and how you make it work. Yes. And then I'm true to myself, and I, I believe I'm true to God. Yeah, to say, this is what I want, Father, but mostly I want what you want. Yep. Show me what that is. Yep. Well, uh... When my son died, my, my, my cousin of mine and I had been praying. She asked me to pray. Albert was in her last hour. And she said, let's pray that he takes my son. She had a son that was really sick with lots of terrible problems and leave your son alive. But God chose to take my son that was perfectly healthy and everything. And the, the first day, that moment and the first days, I was so close to Jesus. But then, a month or two later, I was so angry because he took my son, you know, I was like, I said, you take my son. But if my son had not died, I would never have moved to the United States because I moved to the United States and I moved three, to three different houses for other stories in a month. And the, the, the third one was a Christian girl that we became very close friends. She took me to church. And I started reading the Bible, and I accepted Jesus, and then my son who had gone to college accepted Jesus, and then my other son accepted Jesus, yeah. and now my daughter accepted Jesus. So there's always a way that, that we don't understand all that pain and all that turmoil it was so that we all become Christians. Right. Yes. And hallelujah. And I think we have examples of that, and that certainly happens. To be completely fair, there are some times when we don't in this life know why. Yeah. When we when we don't ever get an affirmation, and that's where our faith comes in. God has shown us so much of His love and of His grace and of His goodness that it's when we don't see the clear explanation that God really is saying, "I'm there for you. I need you to trust me, even though you don't understand." And that's when it's hard, but that's also when it's most significant. Jane. I have a friend whose husband is very ill, um, and recently in an email conversation, I believe he, he will die, um, she wrote and said, pray boldly. Would you comment on that, Ross? I think that we should pray boldly. I think Jesus was praying boldly in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I think, I, I think we should start out by saying, Father, show us what your will is that we can pray wisely. And unless God gives you a clear sense that, no, this is not how he wants us to pray. This is not his will. And if he doesn't say that to you, you don't have a clear sense of that, then I think we can pray boldly as long as in our being bold, we leave room for God answering in a way that we didn't expect. Okay? We can pray boldly, but too often I think if people pray boldly, 
with some sort of expectation that being bold means God has to do it the way you ask, and God then doesn't do what you ask, where are you? If you can pray boldly and still accept God's final answer on something, then that's fine. That's good, even. You know, start with asking Him what He desires. Based on what he, what he tells you, pray boldly within that, and then be willing to say at the end, Father, I confessed up front that I don't, I don't see everything, I don't understand everything, your will has been done in this, I accept that even if I don't understand it. Then it's fine. Then we should be praying boldly. You know, God doesn't want us praying half-heartedly. Jesus was not half-hearted, now he prayed. You know, um, sweat and blood and tears like drops of blood. So, all right, we're going to take a break for, let's say, five minutes. I'm going to talk a little bit at, at the very end about prayers being answered, not being answered, but I want to talk just a minute about what is required if we expect, expect our prayers to be answered. Some people very cavalierly will say, well, Jesus said if two or more ask, he has to give it. Or if you ask in faith, then he's promised he'll respond. You know, if you have faith as a mustard seed, Ask it will be done for you. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. They very conveniently leave some pieces out. This passage from John 15 is the one that's often quoted. I'm going to read the whole thing and then I want to come back and make three points about what is required from us if we expect our prayers to be answered. Okay? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in His love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Now, there are four points in here that I want to make relevant to what, what we're talking about with regard to what is required of us if we expect God to, to answer our prayers. Um, the first one is... If we are in Christ and He is in us, then we can expect for our prayers to be answered. What is that other than to say that if we, if we have a relationship with Him, the whole thing we've been talking about, if our relationship was with God the Father through Jesus Christ, and that's the foundation that we live in, if, Christ is, if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, then He has promised that as we pray, those prayers will be answered as we ask. Now again, if that's true that we are in Christ and He is in us, then that will change the way we pray. That will change our expectations. We will have a reorientation of our desires and goals and everything else. But that is one of the characteristics or qualifiers in there. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. A second thing is that if we obey His commands and remain in His love, verse 10, we have to be obedient children. We cannot expect that we just pretty much do whatever we want, follow our own desires and ways of living, and expect that, that God and Jesus Christ is going to always give us what we want. Are we obedient to His commandments? That's another qualifier that's in here. The third, which is related to that, is, is are His words in us? Does His word abide in us? And how does His word abide in us? I think another way of saying that is, are we taking His Word into us? Are you studying the things of God to seek to be more like Christ? If not, then we are not qualifying for part of what He said was, was the requirement for Him to hear and answer our prayers that we would want. 
And lastly, are we bearing fruit? It says, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So this passage, which is often, they'll just quote part of it. Um, ask whatever you wish it will be given to you, for instance, without mentioning the part, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Are we studying the Word of God and taking it into us? Do we have an understanding of that? Are we seeking to be in relationship with Christ, abiding in Him and Him in us? Are we being obedient to His commands, which again, we get out of this book? Are we bearing fruit that God desires for us? Again, out of obedience, the fruit of obedience, and then the Father will give us whatever we ask in, in, in Jesus' name. There are requirements. This isn't a one-way street. Again, it's not the cosmic bellhop. We ring the bell and tell him what we want, and he is obligated to bring it to us because he works for us. No. That's not what Scripture says. There are... Now, the good part of that is, if we are seeking a relationship with him, and our relationship is growing, if we are seeking for his words to be in us and to obey his commandments, if we are seeking to bear godly fruit as God desires for us, then he has promised to be responsive when we ask. But you know what? If we're doing those things, then that very likely is going to change the things we're praying for over if we were not seeking to be in that kind of relationship with Christ. Okay? Questions about that? Critical to understanding the nature of prayer. Yes? It's, he's elevated us from servants to friends. Right. Who understand the master's business. Yeah. So when you're a servant, you don't know what's going on. You're just doing your job. But when you're a friend and you understand, then absolutely you'll have a better sense of where it's going and what right. right. He, he, he is transparent with us. He makes it clear to us. He wants us to understand. I've said before, God does not desire to trap us or trick us or trip us up. He wants us to succeed. And he's telling us how to do it. So why is prayer so hard? Why does prayer seem so hard? I think the first thing is because we don't know what we're looking for. The old thing about if you don't know what you're looking for, you know, if you don't know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, we have to have a clear understanding about what the purpose of prayer is. And that's part of the reason I'm teaching this stuff. Do we know what prayer is and what it's for and what it's about? If we don't, then obviously it's going to be hard because we don't know what we're doing. Of all people, Richard Nixon's grandmother, who was a Quaker, Nixon came from a friend's or Quaker background, she said this once to her grandson. What thee must understand, Richard, is that the purpose of prayer is to listen to God, not to talk to God. <laughs> the purpose of prayer is not to tell God what thee wants, but to find out from God what he wants from thee. We don't know what prayer is. We don't understand that it is a relationship, and that much of it is asking God, what is your will, so that I can be in that will and consistent with so we don't know what we're looking for. That's one of the reasons why it's hard. We have to have a right understanding of what prayer is and of how it works. The second reason is because prayer can be hard work, and we don't like hard work. This was the same thing that we quote, we talked about last week with Bible study. We fail to grow in the spiritual disciplines, not because we don't understand, but because we're lazy. We don't want to take the time to do what is necessary. We don't want to commit the time to grow in the Lord. And growing spiritually is very much like growing physically. You have to be prepared to exert some effort to get there. I always said, you know, to, to be in shape, they say you have to work out. I'd be much better if they said you had to play out. Yeah. But the fact is you have to work out. Well, you have to work in spiritual disciplines in order to grow in them. There are a million excuses we come up with for not doing this because we don't want to. Because it's not always easy. It's hard, in fact. E.M. Bounds, a writer on spiritual matters, said this, The praying which gives color and bent to character is no pleasant, hurried pastime. Praying is spiritual work, and human nature does not like taxing spiritual work. Human nature wants to sail to heaven under a favoring breeze, a full sail, a smooth <laughs> sea. Prayer is humbling work. So we come to one of those crying evils of these times, maybe of all times, and that is little 
or no praying. Of these two evils, perhaps little praying is worse than no praying. Little praying is a kind of make-believe, a salve for the conscience, a farce, and a delusion. The little estimate we put on prayer is evident from the little time we give to it. No leaving can make up for the failure to pray. No earnestness, no diligence, no study, no gifts will supply its lack. You have to be willing to work at it. Just like anything else, you've got to have a discipline about it. That's why they're called the spiritual disciplines instead of the spiritual fun time. <laughs> we do have to have some discipline. Now, God will bless that, and it will soon become a joy to you. Like I told you about Bible study, at first, when you first start doing this, it's going to seem onerous and hard, and can't I please do something else? If you will discipline yourself to it at, at a point very soon, it will become a real joy. It has for me. I really look forward to it. Okay? I don't get up at 5.30 in the morning because I think that that's just wonderful fun, but I really enjoy it. And so I drag myself out of bed. Okay? And, and that can be true for you too. It's not because I'm somehow more righteous or, or whatever. Trust me. Uh, the third reason why prayer seems hard is because there may be something frustrating our efforts to have a productive prayer life. There are spiritual matters that can keep you from having the right kind of relationship with, with the Lord that, that creates a prayer life. It can be simply a lack of faith. The idea that we don't really believe God is there or that He's listening, then obviously you're not going to get through very well. A telephone call isn't going to be very effective if you're pretty confident that there's nobody at the other end of the line. So a lack of faith can cause that. Unconfessed sin. If you have sin, especially recurrent sin in your life that you have never confessed, that you've never repented of, it doesn't mean you're supposed to be perfect. You're going to have sin. I have sin. We all have sin. But if you have especially recurring sin or sin in your life that you're not willing to admit and confess to, that can block prayer because that can be a, a barrier in a relationship with the Lord. It's possible that bad relationships, especially marriage relationships, can be a block because those things fester in your soul and prevent you from being open to the things of God. And also a selfishness or a lack of giving. If you are so wedded to your money, to your stuff, that you are unwilling to release it even to good causes, to the things of God, the things of the kingdom, then you're not going to get through. That's why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to, enter, uh, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's possible that you are so attached to your money or something else in this life that you have no room there for God. The rich young ruler who had everything else right but could not get rid of his wealth, even though Jesus told him to. And he went away very sad because he was a man of great wealth. It's possible that there is something blocking your relationship with God and you need to prayerfully try to find out what that is. That's one of the things that if you ask God to help you understand why am I having a problem here, I believe he will help you. Scripture says, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask of God, and He will give it to you. If you need wisdom to understand, if you have some barriers in your life that prevent you from being in relationship with God the way you desire it, ask Him to show you what those are, and I believe He will. Mark 9.24, that passage we looked at already, said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe enough to tell you, Father, that I'm not there yet, so help me with that. When the Apostle said to the Lord in Luke 17, increase our faith, he replied, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. All you need to do is have enough to start in faith, and he will bless that. Both Whitney and uh, Richard Foster, in their books, they say one of the most important things for you to realize is that you can learn to pray. All you have to have is that mustard seed of faith saying, Lord, I desire this, help me. And he has promised that he will. You can learn how to do this in a way that's, that is uh, beneficial to you. And Romans 8.26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. If we go to the Lord, even if we don't know how to pray or what to pray, He has promised to help us with that. Brother Lawrence um, wrote a, a famous book called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's a wonderful little devotional book. 
Uh, he was a monk, and he said, you need not cry very loud to God. He is nearer to us than we think. He is anxious to open our hearts and our lives and build that relationship if we will just start. Okay? Prayer is a relationship. Now, there are several obstacles to prayer. I mean, it feels hard. These are in addition to some of the things I just mentioned, the, the need to confess sin or bad relationships or selfishness, those kinds of things. The first one that our culture especially suffers from is the need to be productive. In our culture in the West, we derive our value, our sense of worth, on what we do and what we produce. For many of us, hopefully we've gotten past that because we no longer you know, have titles and you know, jobs and regular incomes or whatever. But for so many people in our culture, many of us find something else that we can replace it with. But for many of us, we are focused more on what we do and what we produce instead of who we are in relationship to God. And that becomes a barrier because this idea that we need to be productive, we have to grow to the place where we are comfortable being ourselves in the presence of God without, without the sense that we have to have some kind of credentials. God does not care about your credentials. He is not impressed by how much you made or how big your house is or how many club boards you serve on. None of that matters, and when we, as long as we keep a, a, a large focus in our life on those kinds of things, we are going to find that an obstacle to the relationship with God. We have to come to Him without all of that encumbrance or the desire to need to be productive or important. Okay? A second thing is our need to stay busy. Busy, busy, busy. If we can just stay busy enough, we don't have to deal with some of our feelings of emptiness or failing or guilt. St. John of the Cross wrote a devotional guide called, in which he talked about the dark night of the soul. And that is that to reach a truly fulfilling relationship with God, you have to recognize your own brokenness, your own lack of worth. We talked about that Bible study this morning. Your own um, inability to be worthy of God's grace. And when you have that dark night of the soul, then you can fully appreciate and understand the grace that is provided to you in Jesus Christ. Okay? The, the uh, spiritual leaders of the past <coughs> talk about um, vacari deo. Vacari deo literally means to be vacant for God or even on vacation for God. To know that we have to find space in our busy lives, time in our busy lives, for the things of God, to literally be on vacation for God. To set aside time and say, Lord, this is your time. There's nothing else that's important. There's nothing else that's going to infringe upon this. I don't. It's not like, okay, I got three minutes, Scott. We've got to do this quickly. <laughs> you know. No, to be literally vacant for God, on vacation for God, the Vicari Deo. The early church fathers identified obsessive busyness that run, 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 busy, 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 you got to go, go, go. The early church fathers called that moral sloth, moral laziness, literally. It is an in unwillingness to confront what is really important, but rather to cover it up with constant busyness. It's a moral problem in us, moral sloth. So, we think we have to be productive, we think we have to stay busy, and then our own impatience is an obstacle to prayer. We, we don't just want slimmer thighs, we want slimmer thighs in 30 days. <laughs> okay, we want to know that it can be done quick, quick, quick. To know God takes time. It does not happen immediately. And wanting everything yesterday, that doesn't work. He is the God of the universe, the God who is above all time, the God of eternity. You really think he's going to snap to and get this done by 2 o'clock this afternoon? It takes time. The relationship with God is not built on sound box. Again, back to that idea of a vacari deo, a willingness to give up ourselves, to give up our time to take the time it needs for us to grow in a relationship with God. And a fourth reason I think that we have obstacles to prayer is our need for a technique. Mm -hmm. Give me the five things I have to do. Okay. Which is why it's hard to teach class like this without you know, sort of feeding you guys exactly that problem. We, are, we as a culture in the West are hyper-rational. We think all we need to succeed is the right training, the right technique, tell me the five things I have to do, tell me the nine steps that are required, you know, let me check the boxes, and I'll be good. All right? A weekend seminar, and I'll be there. There isn't a technique. 
that, that necessarily. Now, there are some guidelines that can help you stay focused, but there is no technique that will guarantee your relationship with God. St. Augustine said, we come to God by love, not by navigation. Technique doesn't get you there. Our prayer life has to be based upon a love relationship. It's not magic. It is not the kind of thing where, okay, I learned the nine special secret words, <laughs> and I got the wand, so now my relationship with God is going to be great. Some people actually approach prayer as though it were magic. If I say the words, mm -hmm. then magical things are going to happen. Um, I believe in magic. There are spiritual powers in the world. Okay? There's a reason why scripture tells us not to mess around with that stuff. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but it's not because it isn't real. It's because it is all too real. But magic and an attitude of, about prayer and relationship with God as though it were magic. Magic in our, relationship, in our relationship between God and us is similar to lust in a relationship between a man and a woman. Yes, it can be there, and it can be a, some kind of relationship. It's the wrong one. It's the impure kind. Magic, this idea that, say the word, snap the fingers, wave the wand, and God has to give you what you want because I've got the technique down. That's not a relationship. That is not what God desires. That is not how we are to proceed. So, obstacles. Need to be productive, need to stay busy, our own impatience, and our need for a technique. Instead, as we prepare to pray, we need to commit ourselves to take time, slow down, be patient, humbly give God control of our time, of ourselves, and our relationship with Him. God has to be the one who is in control. It is His time. It is His decision about this stuff. And so, let's start by recognizing, again, God loves you. He wants you to be in a relationship with Him. Prayer is a gift. It's a privilege. It is a responsibility for Christians. And it is a tender mercy. God desires this for you. He wants the best for you. And yet, when we come to him recognizing it's a relationship that he is granting to us, we also have to recognize that he is smarter than us. He is in charge. It is not, we are not equal partners in this. Unlike what Crocodile Dundee said, God is not my mate. God is the God of the entire universe who has permitted me to be in relationship with him and to come to him. And I need to understand that because he is God and I am not, he is smarter than me and greater than me, then that inherently means there are going to be times in which I ask him for stuff that I shouldn't get. If a child asks you for a shotgun or a bottle of tequila, do you give it to them, even though they may really want it? <laughs> no, because you're smart enough to know that's not what a child needs. We have exactly that kind of thing in our relationship with God. We always have to come to him knowing he loves us and he wants to be in a relationship with us, but it is not a relationship of equals. So don't ever make that mistake. He is not our mate. Secondly, we have to confess that we don't necessarily know how to pray. And there's a biblical model for that. The apostles went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. And he gave a model in the Lord's Prayer. In fact, that's, the Lord's Prayer is recorded in two of the Gospels. And in one place he said, when you pray, pray this. And then the other gospel, he said, when you pray, pray like this. And I think there's a reason why we have both of those. I think that there is, there's value in praying the Lord's Prayer. We use the Lord's Prayer as part of our worship every Sunday. And there's value in using it. When you pray, pray this. But it also becomes a model for us as to how we are to pray. When you pray, pray like this. I think there's a reason why it's worded in two different ways. Yes? It, it's all, in both of those situations, he seems to be talking about corporate prayer, but is there anything wrong with personalizing that prayer? Well, he doesn't necessarily uh, say it's corporate prayer. I mean, they went to him as a group and said, you know, Lord, teach us to pray. But there's nothing that says he wasn't referring to them as individuals as much as he was to them as a group. It could very well be talking about, you know, personal prayer. Okay, except it's, for the pronouns hour. hour and... Well, um, that's true. And, you know, lead us not into temptation and all that. Maybe uh, I was just assuming that. Yeah, but I think that there's there's a sense in which that can also be, there's nothing about it that inherently isn't applicable to personal prayer. 
Okay? So we need to confess that we don't necessarily know how to pray and ask him to help us with that. We then, as I said earlier, need to set aside time for prayer, the Bakari Deo. And when you set aside time for prayer, make sure it's a time when you're alert. Okay? <laughs> Not when you're asleep. Now I get I get up early and I'm okay with that. I drink coffee first. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's fine for me. If that doesn't work for you, then don't try to do it at that time of the morning. Do it at 10 o'clock in the morning when you have your tea or, you know, after lunch or whatever is good for you. But do it when you're alert. And also be aware of the fact that the way your body is positioned makes a difference. There's a reason why kneeling and raising your hands in various other forms, lying pro prone with your face down, what all have been attitudes of prayer that people have assumed, with their bodies. I'm not recommending any particular ones of those, but one of those positions, as opposed to lying flat on your back at 535, right after the alarm is going off, <laughs> which one of those is going to be more effective for you? Okay? Your body does make a difference. Uh, C.S. Lewis said we are amphibious creatures, just like frogs. Frogs live on land, they live in water. We are amphibious creatures because we are both physical and we are spiritual. I'm not recommending any particular physical disciplines to improve your spiritual life, but if you don't recognize that your how your body is positioned and what you're doing with it has some effect on your spirit, then you're not acknowledging the fact that God made us as both spiritual and physical beings. So just be aware of that. Don't expect to be lying down when you're really tired and have an effective prayer life because you'll wake up 40 minutes later wondering if the Lord heard you or not. <laughs> um, and related to that, be practical. Treat your prayer life like your job. Here's a revolutionary idea. If relationship with God is what we were made for, it is the, it's the thing for which we were created, then why are we so clearly disciplined and intentional and practical about how we do our work or our volunteer time with, with whoever, you know, Cruz Roja or, you know, the LCS or anybody else, and yet we seem so lax and easy breezy and whenever it's going to happen kind of with our relationship with God. I think we should be practical about that. And related to that, I recommend keeping a prayer notebook and I may talk about that a little bit more next week as we get started, that we not try to play, pray when we're asleep, that we position our body appropriately, that we talk to God in our regular voice. Do not use your telephone voice with God. <laughs> you know telephone voice. Hello, Ross Arnold. He is. Okay? Don't, you know, don't, unless you are 95 years old and grow up this way, don't use King James English when you talk to God. I come to thee, Lord... Really? Is that, how you, is, is that really how you talk? Be yourself with God. If your mind wanders, try praying out loud. Because when you pray out loud and you hear yourself praying, now obviously this is getting alone by yourself someplace. Uh, better not to do this in the middle of a crowded restaurant or they may be calling somebody. Okay? But when you're by yourself, you, if your mind is wandering, pray out loud and it will help keep you focused. And again, try writing your prayers. Keeping a prayer notebook, I'm referring there to particularly things to pray for that you can come back to. But also try writing out your prayers to the Lord. There is nothing wrong with it. There also is nothing wrong with pre-written prayers. Um, in, in our church service, I, I write out the prayers. The prayers that I do and the prayers that other people do. Now, I do so prayerfully. I do so asking that the Lord give us words that would inspire other people. There is nothing worse than somebody getting up there and humming and hawing and mumbling and stumbling and not knowing where they're going or what they're trying to say. How does that help corporate worship? The church for 2,000 years has said that written prayers that are written, you know, in a godly way, that communicate the things of God, are perfectly legitimate to use in corporate worship. There are places for that. There are places for extemporaneous prayer. There is no reason that we should not be able to use both. Some of the wording, you know, that that the, from the Book of Common Prayer and other great uh, missiles of the faith, that is, books of the faith that lead us, um, so beautifully wrought. They touch people's hearts and their souls, and there's no reason not to use those. Okay? Um, also, try praying by reading Scripture, especially the Psalms. To read some of the Psalms as though, it, you know, it was you praying these things to God. Maybe not some of the psalms that talk about you know, crushing the baby's heads against the rocks and that kind of stuff. But the psalms of psalms of praise and of blessing 
then you can read those as a prayer to the Lord, and it can keep you very focused. Or try using a prayer book, like the Anglican Book of Common Prayer or others. There are other prayer books that you can get. I've got a number of them at home. Uh, so you can try that. When you begin to, and, and stick with it, I forgot that one too. <laughs> no, don't, don't try this for two days and go, huh, I don't think it's working. Right? It took seven days for God to create the universe and rest from it. You're going to learn all that you need to know about prayer and whether or not it works in a couple of days. Stick with it. Okay. Um, questions or comments about any of that? Pat? It says that you have to do something 21 days for it to become. Exactly. You know, it's, it takes, we, we talked about that in Bible, in how to study the Bible class. They say that to develop a real habit, it takes at least 21 days. And in fact, if you had a bad habit that you need to break, it may take you 21 days to break the bad habit, and then 21 more days to create the new habit to replace it. So you may be 42 days into this before you feel like you're settled in. Okay, again? I'm just going to say that I've taken the prayers of Paul prayed for the Ephesians the prayers and personalized them and written them out and they Wonderful. Them and they them away. Right. Did you all hear that? She's taken the prayers from Ephesians that, that Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, written them out and personalized them to herself and used those as prayers. And it's very, been very meaningful. Great idea. Great. I think in charismatic churches, I often hear the term in the prayers I claim this. Yeah. And sometimes that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, I claim this suggests that that idea that I again there's a balance. There's boldness is appropriate, but boldness with humility. And if there's no humility in that, as though God is, you know, being, we're twisting his arm into doing what we want, and that's what claiming it means, then that's wrong. But if it is a kind of boldness in faith, I don't have a problem with that. So much of it just depends upon where the heart of the person is when they say that. Psalm 63, in terms of beginning to pray, is a good place to start. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and upheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. That's a great place to start with your prayers. Okay? I want to spend the next few minutes now talking about the Acts prayer, a structure for prayer. Again, there is a kind of prayer that is purely personal devotional. It's for you to grow closer in your relationship with God. And then there's a practical kind of prayer. There are many kinds of conversations we have as people, even people we're very close to and intimate with. And so I think there is a place and a time for us to have a structured approach to prayer as well. The Acts prayer... The A stands for adoration. We should always begin with an adoration of God. It means to honor Him, to revere Him, to show Him our commitment and love. We Westerners have so much trouble with that. I think sometimes we begin our church service on Sundays with a prayer of adoration. And when I say things like, we worship you, we praise you, we acknowledge you as our Lord and God who made us and everything in the world, I think some people are uncomfortable with that. Because we're not even used to thinking about saying, we adore you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. You are worthy of our worship. But that's what adoration is all about. Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, o our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. That's a prayer of adoration. To say, God, you are God. We adore you and praise you for that. The Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, what's the next line? Hallowed be thy name, which means holy is your name. We worship you, that you are the Holy One. That's that's the you know, Lord's Prayer is very short. That's the aspect of it that is the beginning in adoration. It starts with an adoration. So we adore God, we worship Him. And you know what? If you don't get any further than that on any given day, you've done well. Because that is the most important part. That's the reason you start with that. Too many people say, okay, Lord, let me, let me give you the list of all the things I need. <laughs> oh, by the way, thanks for being God. Amen. You're gone. Right? No, we start with adoration. And then, we leave preaching and go to Medlin. Confession. 
to acknowledge our sin and guilt. 1 John 1, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We need to pray prayer of confession every day, all the time. That doesn't mean you get obsessed with your own sin, because that's a kind of pride. Right? It means that you recognize that you are sinful and you confess it so that God can forgive you and you can move on. I said in Bible study this morning, something I write every day, sometimes many times a day, is the litany from the Anglican uh, service. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant me thy peace. And I mean it. I need his forgiveness every day. I need his mercy every day. Again, yeah, not to be obsessed with that, not to believe that the sacrifice of Christ is not sufficient to forgive me my sins, but I need to always, every day, be willing to confess our sins. John was writing to Christians when he said, If you claim you're without sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins, purify us from all unrighteousness. He was writing to Christians, we need to do that too. And every day... Part of being thankful for the sacrifice Christ made in forgiving us of our sins. So, A, adoration. C, confession. Then T, thanksgiving. To give thanks to God for all... You don't have anything, you haven't done anything, you can't be anything that is not a gift from God. And we need to thank Him every day for His benefits to us, for His gifts to us. For everything. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Psalm 7 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. We need to thank him even, even if we don't can't think of anything to thank him for. We need to thank him just because he is the Lord who is righteous and has made us. And if you can't think of other things to thank him for too, then come on. You're not paying attention. <laughs> not paying attention. <laughs> So we need to thank Him and spend time identifying the things. For one thing, when you, when you focus on the gifts God has given you and you thank Him for them, I believe you enjoy them more. You appreciate them more. You, you benefit from that in a very practical and real way. Lack of thankfulness, lack of gratitude is one of the greatest failings of Western culture. We make the assumption that all this stuff is, is ours because we deserve it. We you don't. It. Yeah, we worked for it. Okay. <laughs> No, even your ability to do the work is a gift from God. So thank you for all of that. And there's a reason why thankfulness comes after confession. We are not worthy of all the things He had given us, so we thank Him for it. And then supplication, which is the same thing as intercession or praying for needs. God said, come before us. You know, come before me. You know, bring your petitions. Bring your needs. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving... That's why we started with that. Present your requests to God. Bring them before the throne of grace and ask for God's mercy. Supplication means to humbly, underline humbly, ask for our needs and the needs of others to be met. And a good idea, I should reverse that. A pretty good idea to keep balance under, under supplication or intercession is don't pray for yourself first. Pray for other people first. That, I think, helps keep balance. You know, even in, in the English language, you know, you when you're referring to somebody else and yourself, you're, it's polite to mention them first. You're, it's bad grammar to mention yourself first, me and her. You know, <laughs> you know should be. Her. She and I. Well, it depends upon the structure. <laughs> it depends upon what, you know, it could be she and I, it could be her and me. It depends upon that setup. Um, um, so, pray for other people first, but do pray for needs. God wants us to. He's asked us to bring our needs to Him with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, and make our requests known to God. So, adoration, honor, revere, show committed love to God, confession, acknowledge our own sin and guilt, and ask for His that for the continuing presence of His grace to forgive us for that. Thanksgiving, to say thank you for gifts and benefits that we've received, and for supplication, to humbly ask for the needs of others and the or ourselves that they would be met. And it's especially keeping it simple is part of what's important about this. The ACTS Acts 
is easy to remember. You shouldn't have a problem remembering adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. That pretty much hits all of the bases. Okay? Questions about that? I want to talk for a couple minutes about the nature of prayer. We've got about 10 more minutes here. Or about seven more minutes here, and then we'll take it from there. Um, yeah, I don't think I plugged that in. Yeah, that I think working? it's going. It's going. Um, some people have argued about prayer that if what we're asking for is good, and God is good, then he's going to do it anyway. If it's not good, then he's not going to do it anyway. And so in either case, my prayer doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. That is a fatalism with, with regard to prayer. And the thing we need to realize is that if that argument is true about good and evil and the nature of a good God and what he's doing, you could use that argument for anything. I might as well just sit home and drink and not try to do anything in my life because the good and loving God will do good things and prevent bad things. But the fact is that's not how it works. And I'm saying this as sort of a background for why we ought to be focused on prayer in terms of praying for the things in the world. Um, there is a mystery here with regard to how our prayers affect things, and we need to understand that. When we pray and we ask God to do something, it's not because God doesn't understand what needs to be done. It's got, not because God isn't a good and loving God. But in some mysterious kind of way, God allows us, even invites us, and encourages us to participate with Him in the way His will is worked out in the world. And that's the mysterious part. It's the same thing about why we give to the church, or why we give to, to the things of, of the faith, why we give to kingdom work. Not because God needs our money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He does it because He gives us the opportunity to participate with Him, and in, therefore, in that way, bless us. Well, when we pray, God gives us, it's almost as though all of creation and all of history is God's massive kind of creative work that he has written. When we pray, God gives us the ability to rewrite small sections of that plot as we go along. Now, it's going to still end up with the same conclusion that God desired. We are not fundamentally changing God's work. But he's allowing us to step in and rewrite little bits of it. And there's a mystery to that, but it's critically important. As long as we are humble about that fact, we need to understand that God blesses us by letting us bring our prayers to him and asking him to be involved in things. And that he desires to help us with that. Now, earlier I said something about magic. And I want to, I want to get back to that again. Um, God has created in the world a cause and effect relationship. And the cause and effect relationship is put there for our protection. What that means is, if I plant beans in order to feed my family, then beans will come up. If I planted beans and roses came up, my family would starve. If every time I flipped a light switch, instead of the lights coming on, some house in San Antonio Tlaicapan blows up because cause and effect doesn't work anymore, then the world would be in chaos. God has created a world in which cause and effect is in place for our protection. This is why God does not allow us to pursue magic or sorcery or spiritism. Not because those things aren't real, but because when we try to affect the natural world by those supernatural means without God involved, being involved, we in effect are trying to subvert the natural order God has created. And the potential disastrous ramifications of that we cannot even predict. We aren't smart enough to know what's going to happen in that case. So what do we do with a situation where there is something beyond my ability to affect it in the natural order of things? When someone is ill and I love them and I want to, I want them to be better, do I look up, look for a shaman? Do I try to find some magical passages that I can use to bring them back to health? God says no. You don't do that. You don't try to subvert the natural order of things by magic or sorcery or spiritism or appeal to the power of demons because you aren't smart enough 
to control those things. I mean, human um, writings down through history, creative writing, is rife with stories of things like Faust. We're thinking that we're going to control, you know, the spiritual powers to do things we want. We end up being crushed by them. And yet, God is not so callous a God that he says that when there is something beyond our power or ability to affect, that we're just stuck. No, God has said, if there are things that you need, desire, that, that you would see happen, you shouldn't try to do something supernatural to affect it, but you can come to me in prayer. We are not wise enough or capable enough, strong enough, wise enough to, to affect the supernatural and violate the natural order of things. But God is. And so he has given us permission to come to him at times like that. The cause and effect in the world is a good thing. It's there for our protection. It's there for us to be able to live in this world. But God knows there are times when we need to set that aside, or we would desire at least to set that aside for the sake of something that we cannot control in the natural world. And so he has given us the ability to come to him and pray to him and ask him to do something extraordinary. And that's the nature of prayer. And that's how prayer is different than magic. Prayer is in the context of our relationship with the Almighty God who can change things, even outside the natural order. That's what miracles are. Magic is an effort by us to change the natural order of things and to try to take our own authority to control forces that we can't control in order to change it. Like I said, one is a relationship of love and the other is the equivalent of lust. It is, it's there and it's real, but it's not good. Okay, so part of what I think we want to understand, C.S. Lewis talked about the fact that God is like our schoolmaster. And the schoolmaster gives us, his students, freedom within the boundaries of the schoolyard to play on anything we wish. We can play anywhere we want within the schoolyard, <coughs> anything we want. And he has promised to be available to us if we need help, or if we hurt ourselves, or if we have particular needs, we get thirsty, whatever it is. But the schoolmaster who is God has also insisted that there are some things that are too dangerous for us to play on alone. And if we need or desire those things, if we wish to do those things, then we need to come to him and ask. And in relationship with us, he will guide us and direct us on what is best. And if it's appropriate, then he will work with us for the accomplishment of those things. I mention that to you because there are a lot of people who believe, who do believe that prayer is a kind of magic. It's not. It's, it's fundamentally different. Prayer is God's gracious, being open to us in relationship, communion with Him, and in the, in the context of that relationship, that He can perform the miraculous. But it's not magic. Okay? Questions about that or anything else? I just wanted to mention that because I've had, when I've taught classes like this before, I get a lot of questions from people about, you know, the nature of prayer as opposed to other supernatural forces that we might use. There is only one source for an appropriate um, appropriation of the supernatural, and that is God himself. Okay. Questions or comments? There are a number of other, a couple people had questions on me, a number of other different aspects of prayer that we might get into a little bit later <coughs> in the class, but there's only how much we can do at once. <laughs> it's about as much. Now, you know, I think this is it. <laughs> That's the limit of how much we can do at once. Ron? Well, one question in regard to magic. We see many times on, on television the psychic that really says she is able to read and understand and hear. Yep. And you put those into what category? Uh, magic or? Well, uh, first, a lot of those people are just charlatans, but not all of them. Again, people in our Western world, they think, oh, well, you know, the spiritual doesn't really exist. Demons don't really exist. None of that stuff is real. It's all just made up. Sorry for those people who believe that, but this says that they're real, that demons are real, the supernatural is real, sorcery is really possible. But stay away from it because it's going to do nothing but hurt you. And so some of those people who are on TV or whatever, who claim to be able to communicate with spirits and all of that, I think they really can. And that's exactly why we need to stay away from them. This is not something God has given us permission to do, because as I was just saying, 
Only God can countermand the natural order. When any other effort is made by us or anybody else to countermand the natural order, we are doing so at our gravest peril, both spiritual peril especially, but even physical peril, because we cannot control those things. Right. Something silly and something serious. When the spiritualist network went broke, they said, if only we'd seen that coming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of using the term talking to God, why don't we say communicating with God? Yeah. Yeah. Or being in a relationship with God. Yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Carolyn always joked, and she'd be reading the paper and say, oh, well, there's a psychic network in town. But then you do that. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a great weekend. We will see you next week. And if